So in our introduction video, we, we introduced this idea of an antiderivative, right? We talked about the fact that, well, you know, we have lots of derivative formulas. We know how to take the derivative of pretty much anything. And now we're interested in this question of can we, can we reverse the process, right? Can we um, come up with an antiderivative for a given function? So this means if you've got a function, you want to know whether you can come up with some other function such that when you take the derivative, you get this function that you already have, right? And we saw that an example of this is if you have a power function, an antiderivative is given by 1 over n plus 1, x to the n plus 1, okay? With kind of two, we added, there's kind of two important technical details here. Uh, one is that this doesn't work if n is minus 1, right? If n is minus 1, our antiderivative is the natural log. Uh, the other is that if we want the sort of most general answer, you should put this constant, this plus c, right? You put this constant because we know that if you take the derivative of a constant, you will get 0. And we talked about the fact that, you know, once you know one antiderivative, all other possible antiderivatives are obtained by adding this constant of integration. Um, now, uh, writing things down in this language gets a little bit um, wordy, so there, there's sort of an alternative notation that we use here. Um, so given f of x, right, we denote by this notation. So this is called an integral sign. We're going to see more of this very soon. Um, so the integral of f of x dx um, is how we read this. Um, we'll, we'll specify this in a second. And we would write this as, so this is just standing in for our antiderivative. Typically, we include that constant of integration. Uh, now, what this thing is called is this is called the indefinite integral. of our function f, okay? So the reason for this terminology is maybe not so clear yet because we haven't talked about integration. We haven't seen the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time before we see how these things tie together, right? Um, so the reason we call this an indefinite integral is there's also something called a definite integral, right? Now, definite integrals, as we're going to see, are used to calculate areas, okay? And the difference, at least in terms of notation, between an indefinite integral and a definite integral is, is that a definite integral is going to have some numbers here called the limits of integration. We're going to see those popping up later, right? Um, and, but the odd thing is, at least on the face of it, indefinite integrals and definite integrals, they, they have nothing to do with each other, right? An indefinite integral is just fancy notation for antiderivatives, right? Definite integrals have to do with area. Um, the remarkable thing is that these are somehow related, right? And, and this is going to be the, the main result of the fundamental theorem of calculus. The fundamental theorem of calculus is going to tie together these ideas of integration and differentiation. The fundamental theorem is going to tell us that somehow antiderivatives can be used to calculate area, right? So that's, that's coming down the pipeline um, a couple chapters from now, right? So we are going to be able to make those connections. Right? Uh, now, one of, the, one of the ways that we might just make use of this in the meantime is this is a convenient notation because it gets kind of wordy to always have to say, you know, uh, that, you know, the antiderivative of little f is this function big F. This you know, you have to write out these sentences and, and it's not so nice for writing down formulas. Uh, right. So in some sense, this indefinite integral, think of it as a counterpart of the Leibniz notation for derivatives, right? Remember when we, 
we introduced the prime notation for derivatives and we wanted to give derivative formulas, we'd have to say things like, okay, well, if we let f of x equal to e to the x, then f prime of x is also equal, to, you know, you have to write these sentences. But now we can just say things like this, the indefinite integral of x to the n, oops, having some problems with this pen, is equal to x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c, right? So we can, we can write things like that. Now, um, you might be wondering about this, uh, this dx here, right? Why do we write this dx? Uh, well, if you think back, remember, remember when we talked about differentials, right? We said that, you know, if y is equal to f of x, then we can write dy as f prime of x dx, right? Um, so in some sense, you can think of this as this, this indefinite integral is, is something which, which sort of undoes the differential, right? So if you take this indefinite integral and you feed it and a differential, it's going to tell you what function that differential came from, right? So another way to think about this is, is that what we're really saying is that the indefinite integral of dy is just y, right? Um, so, so the indefinite integral cancels the differential. Think of it that way, right? These things cancel out. Um, the only thing is that, well, we might be off by a constant, right? Because the derivative of a constant is zero, and that would disappear um, when we take the differential.